Good morning to all of you. We are worshiping here in our congregation this morning. We've had a good worship today. Our numbers are maybe not uh, as large as we'd like to see them, uh, and we miss you if you're not able to be with us this morning. Hopefully sometime real soon you can uh, resume your uh, joining us for worship. It's great to be able to be back together. Tom, talking a little bit about eschatology over the next few months, um, here and there, not nonstop, and uh, we'll sprinkle some of these uh, sermon topics or we'll sprinkle the sermon time with uh, other more practical subjects that will be of good use to all of us. But I want to say here at the beginning that I, I don't uh, view this as, um, oh, I, I can't think of a better word. The word esoteric means for just a few select people. And I don't mean this lesson to be that. I think sometimes this topic or this category of Bible study is relegated to a class setting for people who really want to go deeper. And that's all fine and good, but it is biblical, it is textual, and we need to study it. So I'm not making an apology for this uh, series, and I will say here from the outset that uh, I uh, sometimes I try to maybe over-examine uh, what it is that triggers in my mind a desire or a, a sense that we really need a study on a topic. And uh, I think that which has triggered this is, uh, again, twofold. Maybe it's uh, conversations with some friends and relatives on this topic. But secondly, um, every time there seems to be some great calamity in the history of the world, this is true on a national level, uh, but e even more so when it uh, takes on a worldwide scope, which as uh, has been alluded to in our prayers this morning, this uh, pandemic has tended to feed, uh, it, it has proven to be a breeding ground for all kind of conversations about es eschatology. Now, let me pause there because some of you may be totally in the dark. And I wanna say at the outset here too, I'm not gonna strong arm any of you to have to agree with me on this particular topic. Many people do not. But on the other hand, I don't want to leave the impression that to uh, just believe whatever you wanna believe. The basis of our beliefs is the word of God. And so we'll, we'll all, myself and you, we're gonna all spend the rest of our days trying to figure out are we in line with the word of God? And we need to try to be in line with the word of God on all kinds of doctrinal issues, eschatology notwithstanding. But you have a little place for notes. Uh, sometimes Jeannie says to me that uh, I'm just kind of a um, misplaced Bible professor, college Bible professor. Maybe if I had my uh, druthers back uh, when I started, I would have... Uh, gone on for a little more study and, and found myself in an academic setting. I enjoy a lecture kind of thing. I'm not trying to make that this, but I would love to be able to tell you all quite seriously, would you take out your notebooks and take notes? Because we're going to have a big test on this later on. <laughs> and if you're not paying attention, I'm going to find out uh, later on. So there is that part of me that would like to really hold you accountable uh, sometimes we're too lax in our worship services. We just uh, think people can get it by osmosis, hear it over and over again, and we don't really encourage uh, a studious environment in the uh, giving and receiving of sermons. I wish there, that was otherwise because if we're doing our job as a preacher, we're putting a lot of time into subjects like this or any Bible subject. And that seems to me uh, to be worthy of your paying really close attention and taking notes. So you can begin in your little note box there by the sermon that the word eschatology, which is kind of intimidating to a lot of people, it should not be 
because it's just a, a compound word, you know the, the suffix, the L-O-G-Y, O-L-O-G-Y, is uh, just, it's really the Greek word for words. So you have that same suffix in all kind of subjects like geology and biology and archaeology and on and on we could go. Well, eschatology is words about. That's what that L-O-G-Y, words about eschatos. Eschatos is not a hard word. You can practice it and say it. Eschatology. Eschatos is the Greek word for last things, uh, end things. So eschatology may sound intimidating, but it's just a study of last things. Every once in a while, you know, the phone number that's on the board out in the yard there is connected to our home. We don't have a phone in the building here, actually. But every once in a while, somebody will call. Usually it's some brethren, and they will make inquiry asking, do, does, does, this, does this church believe in eschatology? This poorly worded and sometimes really dumb question uh, really gets under my skin. I just want to say, well, I hope we do. And I hope every congregation believes in eschatology because eschatology is quite biblical. But I don't. I bite my tongue and I gather a sense that what they're really asking is, do we at least the leadership of this congregation, myself included, along with our elders and deacons and others, do we affirm a view <clears throat> that's known as fulfilled prophecy or realized eschatology? That's what they're really asking when they call. And oftentimes I'll be totally candid with them and I'll say, well, yes, we do. And then I'll go into some t details and it's surprising what responses you get, some good, some bad. So I want to share with you some eye-opening truths about eschatology uh, over the next few weeks. As a preacher, it's really easy to avoid difficult subjects. Difficult doctrines, and I would put eschatology in that category, and if you don't think it falls in that category, <clears throat> then you can maybe take it up with Peter, because Peter referred to Paul as writing many things, some, are, some of which are hard to understand, and the, the context for Peter saying that is talking about last things. It's found in Second Peter chapter 3, and I don't know, that verse may be around 18. I, I don't know. When I was young, I could tell you exactly. The older I get, the less I'm sure of the exact number, but I think I've got the chapter right on. So as a preacher, we, we sometimes shy away from difficult doctrines. They're hard to understand. And even if we tip our toes into the water, uh, we risk the possibility of offending some. You can just about mark that down. <clears throat> on any given Sunday, if you talk about a difficult doctrine, you're going to have some people upset with you because they're not going to agree, whatever the subject might be. <clears throat> There's a lot of difficult doctrines we could make a list of this morning. <clears throat> <clears throat> I feel obligated also to try to make corrections <clears throat> because so many pe people have blundered, some terribly so, some embarrassingly so, on this particular topic. They are misrepresenting Scripture. From the first century onward, believers have <clears throat> rightly... <clears throat> excuse me, I, I am not sick that way. I've just got a raspy throat this morning. If I really could do two things at once, I have a cough drop here, so maybe I'll try that. From the first century onward, believers have failed to rightly divide the word of truth. Paul was concerned about that. He wrote about that 
when he wrote to the young preacher Timothy saying, urging them to rightly divide the word of truth, which, is mean to, which really means to accurately interpret the word of truth. And there are many people <clears throat> that, who charge forth with zeal and bluster, <clears throat> especially in light of what we're talking about today, and they, are, they charge forth warning their family and friends and foes about a rapidly approaching so-called end of time, totally, totally unaware of any distinction between the end of time and the time of the end. Now, if you fall asleep during any part of this lesson, don't, don't miss that point. I'm going to say it again, maybe even more emphatically, maybe even more boldly, and and it might get the hackles up on the back of your neck and you want to challenge it, and I'm okay with that. That's, That's how iron sharpens iron. One man sharpens another. Here's my statement. The Holy Scriptures speak often about the time of the end, but nowhere, nowhere, do they address the end of time? Now, I know the reaction some of you are having. You're you're wanting to pull on the reins and say, whoa. I'm going to say it again. The Holy Scriptures speak often about the end of time, but nowhere, uh, often about the time of the end, but nowhere do they talk about the end of time. After challenging people on this point in the past, The response typically rolls in in one of three ways. First, some will promptly cut you off and label you, even so much to say that you're a heretic, and then they will warn others to stay away. Sometimes you don't even get a second chance to make another statement. Secondly, some will go home. They'll hear that challenge and they'll go home and they will search the scriptures diligently, intending to arm themselves with a, at least a few, a handful of citations, maybe a whole satchel full, that they will bring back to me or the preacher and say, okay, here, in, be, in light of what you said last Sunday, you tell me what all of these passages mean. And really, you might be surprised. Now, this is a dangerous statement to make when we live in a world with so many translations and paraphrases. But if we stuck to the major translations, uh, you would be hard pressed to come back to me with two scriptures. One of them that you might give me is Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, where Daniel is told, seal up the book until the end of time. The only translation I've found that says the end of time is the one that I preach from, which I rely upon so often as being so accurate, the New American Standard. But it is dead wrong on this passage. And most of your other translations will render it as not seal up the book until the end of time, but seal up the book until the time of the end. Now, the trouble with that is Most people, even translators, say, what in the world's the difference? And that's part of the whole point of this series of lessons. There's a huge difference between the end of time and the time of the end. The other passage that is often thrown back in my lap is Revelation 10 and verse 6, where there's a statement where the angel says, there shall be time no longer. And really what that verse is saying, and you'll find it, In most other translations, the angel is talking about giving a revelation about the time of the end. And the angel says, there'll be, there's not going to be any delay any longer. Now is the time that I'm going to tell you about the time of the end. We're not putting it off anymore. God had put it off details of it for a long time. But other than Daniel 12 and Revelation 10, 6, there's not much. There is not much. You're on shaky ground if you want to 
uh, dispute that statement. The Holy Scriptures speak about the time of the end. They speak about the time of the end often, but nowhere do they address the end of time. Not even those two verses, which are very poor translations. Thirdly, and I'm glad that I can share this response, some will return with genuine excitement. You can read it in their eyes. You can see it even in their body language. They come back to you with genuine excitement as if a light has gone on in their head and they're seeing things clearly, more coherently than they've ever seen them in their lives. And I tell you, there is not a greater feeling that I have that when I drop some of these thoughts out there and somebody comes back and says, I can't quit studying and lights are going on all over the place. Whereas I used to read these passages and I had no clue as to what they mean. Now they make sense because we've got the proper framework. So as to eschatology, there are many who are contending, many who are contending for views. And I don't have time to go into all of those views, but many views that are not only unbiblical, but unhealthy. And some of you are seeing that reaction from, from some among your loved ones, friends, families. They're filled with angst. They're nervous about things. Uh, Millard Erickson <clears throat> writes, I don't know that he coined these words, maybe he did. He talks about two words that have entered into our vocabularies uh, from a uh, church point of view over the last couple decades. And the first word is what he calls eschatomania. And the second word, he says, is eschatophobia. Now you can figure that out. The first, eschatomania, is an intensive preoccupation with eschatology. And the latter is uh, a fear for or an aversion to studies about the end. People don't even want to go there because it makes them so upset. Well, I, I don't suffer from either. I'm glad that I can tell you that. I am not afraid of eschatology. I have no phobia about it. And neither am I an eschat- eschatomaniac. <laughs> Some of you can vouch for me there because you've not heard a, a steady flow of this topic over the last, how long have I been with you now? I mean, you've heard some. But so I want to ask you to suspend your preconceived notions for a little while and contemplate an alternative possibility. I think it's quite biblical. And this will be a challenge, a great challenge for you, because it's not easy to let go. I, I tell people often, I would rather study with somebody who has no knowledge of the Bible than to take on somebody who has been raised in the church. And the simple reason for that is before, sometimes before you can make a lot of progress, you've got to erase the board. And some people will not let go of things that they've been taught forever and ever, and they think it's thoroughly biblical. They won't even give it a chance to say, maybe I was mistaught or maybe I've been misguided. So I want you to try to do that as hard as it is, is to just suspend any preconceived notions, especially in the realm of eschatology. And I want to ask this question, what if, what if New Testament eschatology does not pertain to planet Earth, but rather, what if New Testament eschatology is a, a way of talking about the fulfillment of Old Testament truths. Indeed, I'm affirming that the New Testament speaks about the time of the end, but it doesn't say anything about the end of time. I ran into this on a phone conversation with a dear loved one not long ago where they kept pressing me, but what does God say about the end of planet Earth? And In all honesty, all I could say was, in the words of some of our brethren from years gone by, all I can do is speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. And the Bible doesn't talk about 
planet Earth, the end of planet Earth. Now, I, I don't want to overwhelm you this morning, but I just challenge you to go home with that uh, little newsletter. And there's an article there. I don't remember what I called it. I think the Ark of God's Promise. And that Ark is not A-R-K, although this, uh, this essay sprang from the story of Noah's Ark and the flood. But if you remember after the uh, flood waters receded and the water subsided, Noah came out of the ark with his family and he built an altar. And then it says that God smelled the offering and it smelled so beautiful to him. I'm paraphrasing, read the text. The scriptures are in the essay. But God then responded in the aftermath of having caused the flood. He said, I will never do this again. I will never do this again. Well, our brethren have assumed, and, and he followed up on it by saying, I'm going to put an ark in the sky, the rainbow. And every time you see that rainbow, you remember the promise that I'm making today. But you know what our brethren have done with that? I grew up with this. Didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And I know if you read Genesis 7, 8, and 9, you will find where I will never again destroy the earth with water. But what they do is they take that, and I know 2 Peter 3, so don't look at me like I'm a turnip. But they make God as if God comes out and smells the aroma from Noah's altar sacrifice. And it's as if they have God saying, I don't think they even see this, but it's like they have God saying, I will never do this again. And then he turns around and says, but next time I'm going to burn you to a crisp. That is totally, totally a disruption of the spirit of that text. The whole purpose of the rainbow is to say to God to say to the world, this will never happen again. And again, we argue, well, no, no, it won't be a flood again, but it's going to be a fire. God said, I will never again destroy the earth. Now, you can get hung up on the water part if you want. And I know 2 Peter 3, but I'm just telling you the spirit of that text is, it's as if God is saying, now we will proceed with what I have planned with for all time. And we'll figure out a way to bring you back into my company, but it's not going to be by a destruction of planet Earth. It'll be to bring in, to borrow from Hebrews, and I'm ad-libbing here, God decided he would create a new and living way. And to bring that about, the world had to be turned upside down. And he had to bring in a new covenant that totally changed what they had learned and been under for years and years. All right, back to my notes because I am on the time clock uh, only because of uh, restraints that come with putting something on uh, Facebook. When you go over a half hour, it gets a little dicey. So for us 21st century Christians, eschatology should not be something that stirs up uh, angst and nervousness, but rather it should be a celebration of joy as we rest securely in the knowledge of the fulfillment of God's eternal plan of salvation. Now that's a mouthful and you'll need to digest it and I'm not at all hesitant to tell you, go to the, go to the website and look at these notes. Uh, let me speed up a little bit. A few Sundays ago, we examined Peter's exhortation in 1 Peter 4, 7. He said, the end of all things is at hand. Oh, I don't have time to rehearse all of that this morning. That's a, that's a really good sermon. And it's a really good starting point for us to talk to our friends about what they think is happening in in a, a celestial realm uh, about to confront planet Earth. Peter said to a first century audience, the end of all things is at hand. Did he know what he was talking about? If he did, what did he mean by the end? And what did he mean by all things? Because 2,000 years have passed and everything's still going on like always. So some are even driven to say, well, Peter was mixed up. Peter was confused. But I just want to ask if Peter was right 
That's the point of our lesson this morning. If Peter was correct in what he said, and I think he surely was, the end of all things is at hand. I want to know where did Peter get these bold words? Where did Peter get these provocative thoughts or ideas? Has Peter gone rogue in writing this? He, Peter is neither an anomaly, which means a kind of a one of a kind, He is neither an anomaly nor what might be called an outlier, meaning you can't find this anywhere else in the New Testament, but Peter seems to go off uh, into some tangent and he, his words are not the exception, but they're the norm. That's the point I'm trying to make to you this morning. Peter stands squarely in the midst of a united apostolic voice. What we hear Peter say in 1 Peter 4, 7, 17, or 1 Peter 4, 7, is not unusual. It is typical for what we find in the New Testament. Now, let me uh, hasten through some others. John wrote a gospel. He wrote three epistles and the book of Revelation. And like Peter, he was present for the Olivet Discourse. Now, that will be the subject of our study if not next study, next Sunday, the, the one after. And I'll tell you why that's so important. In Mark 13 and verse 3, his version of the Olivet Discourse tells us that uh, Peter and John are, are right there with Jesus uh, when he answers their question. But this John, he writes in 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. When I read this text, some of you, are going to, if you're honest, you're going to say, I don't know what to do with this verse. Here's what it says. Children, this is John writing to a first century audience. And he says, children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard, Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrist, with an S on the end, plural, have arisen. And from this, we know, we know that it's the last hour. What? Peter lived in the first century. He wrote to first century people and he told them it was the last hour. That kind of jives with Peter saying the end of all things is at hand. Now we read John saying it's the last hour. And then we turn over to that book of Revelation and I'll not take time on this. This is a, That's a whole series in itself. But Revelation 1 and verse 1 and 1 and verse 3 begins this way. I often tell people, I don't, we're going we're gonna to have some disputes about how to interpret the book of Revelation. But one thing that ought to be indisputable is to recognize the way the letter begins and closes. It's as if everything inside of it is bookended by time constraints. Here's the way the book of Revelation opens. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, the things which must shortly take place. Did you hear that? And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John. And then in verse 3, he says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is at hand. Whatever you do with Revelation, you better honor those stipulations. The book closes the same way. Another is the book of James. James was not one of the 12 apostles. There was a 12 apostle named James, but this is a different one. But he's an apostle nonetheless, according to Galatians 1.19. And let me read a couple verses from what he wrote. James 5, verses 7 through 9. Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious produce of the ground, being patient about it until he gets the early and later rains. You too, writing to a first century audience, you too be patient, strengthen your hearts. You probably can fill in the blank. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. And then he adds, do not complain, brethren, one against another, that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. Now, how much sense does that make if we're still waiting for that to happen? 
John writes with a sense of urgency. Peter writes with urgency. Uh, now James is right. He's saying the judge is right at the door, but here we go with 2,000 years. Nothing's happened. Or maybe something did happen, but we missed the arena of its happening. Acts chapter 9 tells of the conversion of Saul, who became known as Paul, who wrote more of the New Testament epistle, or more of the New Testament than anybody. Uh, if you turn with me to two passages from Paul, we could have a slew of them, but Romans 13 and 11, 12. And this we do, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now is salvation nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day is at hand. And then he says something rather bizarre. He's been accused of maybe being anti-woman, but in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 29 and 31, Paul says this, I say, this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened, writing to people in the first century. And he said, the time has been shortened so that from now on, those of you who, who have wives should be as those who have none. For the, listen to this, for the form of this world is passing away. If we only think of the destruction of planet Earth, we have to say, wait a minute, Paul, 2,000 years have passed and this world is still ticking. That wasn't the world that Paul was talking about. The form of this world is passing away, but it wasn't planet Earth. It was the Old Testament realm. Couple more. From Hebrews 10, 36 and 37, we don't know for sure who wrote it. I think it could have been Paul, but I'll grant you somebody else. And here's what the writer says. You, talking to a first century audience, you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised as though, uh, that you may receive what was promised. And then here's the end of that statement. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Whether one reads from Peter or Paul or James or John or any and all of the New Testament writers, there is a consensus that is built. Their inspired documents are written with an air of expectancy. Have you ever noticed that? I was, when I was a teenager, this jumped off the pages at me. There was, there's an air of expectancy. There's an expectation of nearness. These events are not flung into some far distant future. They're on edge about them. They know they're coming and they're coming soon. There's a sense of imminency. The language of the New Testament pulsates with an eager anticipation of fulfillment with the arrival of the things to come. I think that is as true a statement as you will ever hear. We are, we are driven then to ask, where did the New Testament writers get this idea? Where did Peter and Paul and James and John and Jude and any others, where did they get these ideas? Their words of exhortation were not new or novel. Let me tell you that right from the start. But rather they were a reiteration of what Jesus had taught them. That's all they were. I mean, I don't mean to undermine them. All they did was say what Jesus had said to them. And we'll look at that next Sunday or the week after. For three years, remember, Jesus walked among his disciples. He was a masterful teacher. The words that he spoke and the manner in which he delivered these words were so impressive. You, you found yourself feeling that way when you read the Gospels. And one could rightly declare that his classroom changed the world. Technically speaking, Jesus didn't have a classroom per se. His class was wherever he was. Um, in the early 300 BC, Aristotle came to be popular for teaching his students while he walked around the Lyceum just outside of the city of Athens. They would walk with him and he would impart knowledge and information. Well, Jesus did that, but he, it's called a peripatetic style, just 
you walk and teach as you walk. And Jesus did that more than Aristotle could have ever imagined. His classroom was everywhere, not just the Lyceum. Everywhere Jesus went, he was engaged in uh, this peripatetic ministry. But Jesus was not just a peripatetic teacher, teaching as they walked, but he was a prophetic teacher. Before Jesus was crucified, he gave to his apostles what has been come to be known as the Olivet Discourse. You would be surprised how ignorant we are on this. I could poll a lot of churches and say, does anybody know where you find the Olivet Discourse? And some would, if they were honest, they would say, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. The Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse found in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, and Luke chapter 21. This body of prophetic utterances is the whole foundation for things eschatology about which the uh, apostles would write about. Now, I don't know. Sometimes we chuckle at this. Can you imagine being one of the apostles? You're walking with Jesus, and he's talking all the time you're walking. You don't have a little laptop to, you know, you don't even have paper and pen, pencil, uh, a notebook and a backpack and whatever. Say, like, hold on, Jesus, let me write this down. There was so much that they taught, but Jesus assured them they were trying to listen. They were inquisitive. They would come like we read in Matthew 24 and say, Lord, would you tell us a little bit more about this? But they couldn't contain it all. But Jesus promised them that uh, they would get guidance. So your assignment next Sunday is to go back and see what Jesus taught them. And you can do it in one fell swoop. I'd recommend you read Matthew 23 and 24. But you can read all of the synoptics on that same topic. And uh, I think then you're going to see, and I've entitled this lesson today, Straight from the Lion's Mouth, and I'm talking about the Lion of Judah. Judah. When I ask the question, where did Peter and Paul and James and John, where did they get these words that sound so hard to comprehend, that sound so filled with expectation and nearness and anticipation? Where did they get these words? The answer is they got them straight from the mouth of the Lion of Judah. So I'm going to give you a sneak preview and then we'll close. What we're going to discover is that the New Testament writers teach us precisely what Jesus taught them. When James and John and Peter and Paul wrote to first century Christians who were living in the last days just prior to the fall of Jerusalem, they simply told them what Jesus had told them. The apostles wrote and told others what Jesus had told them. Their words were echoes of their master. And just in case they forgot the details, oh, how beautiful it was to hear Jesus say to them two texts from John. John 14, 26, just before his crucifixion, Jesus tells them that I'm going to send the Holy Spirit or the Comforter. And he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all of the things that I taught you. Oh boy, wouldn't you like to have that going into a final exam? And he says in John 17, 13, and the Holy Spirit will guide you in all truth. Peter said the end of all things is at hand. How did Peter know? Well, Jesus taught him, but the Holy Spirit guided him in all truth. And, and furthermore, the Holy Spirit, or Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will disclose to you things to come. That's eschatology. He's going to tell you about end time things. One of the saddest, and I close, one of the saddest quotes I've ever encountered is one that runs something like this. Jesus and his apostles thought the end of the world would come in their lifetime but they were wrong. This may seem like a harmless observation from some disgruntled or disenchanted scholar, but trust me, it is not. It comes from some, someone 
who had, has and had read the New Testament over and over and over again with objectivity. Kind of like, I don't want to put myself on that level, but that, that was me as a young teenager aspiring student. I kept reading these texts over and over again so that when I got down to Harding and I could sit by my professors, I could say to them, tell me about these verses. This quote comes from a scholar who is very candid and very honest, which some of us are not prone to be or to do. And it's a sad, sad quote because it is so inaccurate. It may be candid, it may be honest, but accurate, no way. No way can we conclude that Jesus and the apostles were mistaken. Jesus was not wrong, and the apostles did not misunderstand him. They were not wrong in what they wrote. The problem is often on our end. We're looking for fulfillment in all of the wrong places. So I say to you in closing, our eschatology is desperately in need of refinement. And that's what I hope you'll join with me as we continue to study. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your word. And Father, bear with us all when we struggle with passages, we don't know what to do with them. Give us patience, but also give us a strong belief that your words are true and accurate, that Jesus knew whereof he spoke, and so did the apostles. And so we ask you to seek harmony, to give us a sense of harmony as we work our way through all of these teachings, that there might uh, be light uh, for us that will lighten our step and give us cheer for the days ahead. Through Christ we pray, amen. Thank you so much uh, for your attention. One of the real um, struggles uh, sometimes with preachers is what to talk about and uh, sometimes a sermon is directed towards those who are not Christians and that's a, certainly a good place for that but sometimes a sermon needs to be directed to the body because we need to know what we believe and we need to be able to share that belief with others. And if the belief is not wrong, we need to be able to say, no, that's not truth. Let's look harder. Thank you for your attention this morning. If we can help any of you in your walk with the Lord, if you're not a Christian, you wanna be one, we would love to help you in seeing the need to confess your faith and be baptized into Jesus Christ. Would you all stand and let's encourage each other by our standing together and also by our singing.